rolling? Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, our event today. Uh, it's a very exciting time for Iridium. And yeah, can we, can we pause the video? <laughs> So we'll, we'll get to the video in a moment here. Uh, first, I would like to uh, welcome everyone for joining us today, uh, everyone on the, the, the live stream as well. It's a very exciting time for Iridium. It's a historic day, and this one has been a long time coming. Uh, with me up here on stage is Iridium CEO Matt Desch, uh, Vice President of Constellation Programs and the Iridium Next Program for Talos Alenia Space, Denia Lard, and Iridium CFO Tom Fitzpatrick. Um, right before we, uh, I introduce Matt to come up and say a few words, just so everyone knows, um, we will be doing a Q&A towards the end. Uh, everyone on the live stream who would like to ask some questions, uh, you can email those questions to me and we will get through as many of them as we possibly can. So uh, to kind of kick things off, we do have a video that we would like to start uh, playing for everyone, uh, it's about three, three and a half minutes, and it'll give you kind of a heads up about why we're here today. So, please. In the 1990s, the founders of Iridium had a bold idea to drive innovation in the way people connect, a vision to develop the most sophisticated communications network in the world. It took 10 years and billions of dollars but in 1998, that vision finally came to life when Iridium's global network of satellites began connecting people, data, and devices from anywhere on Earth. Although the company was a technical success, it was not a business success. The company's business model to compete directly with cellular didn't work. Nine months after its initial service launch, Iridium gave up and stopped service. In 2001, a new Iridium with new owners emerged and the service was reactivated. With a new mission and an updated business strategy in place, the company changed its approach, bringing together innovative partners, businesses that were leaders in the field. These partners shared Iridium's bold vision and together they made headway into new markets where satellite connectivity was essential. Yet like earlier communications, Iridium's original satellites needed to be refreshed to keep up with a growing and evolving demand. Over the last 18 years, Iridium's business transformed into a success, and it was time for the company to reaffirm its commitment to providing the world's most powerful communications network. In 2010, Iridium embarked on a $3 billion replacement of its constellation through the Iridium Next launch mission with a total of 66 operational satellites. This feat represented the largest technology refresh in space history. Five, four, three, two, one, ignition. On January 11th, 2019, the eighth and final Iridium Next launch took place. And now, we celebrate the completion of a brand new network. On February 5th, the commands were sent to activate the final satellite in Iridium's new network, bringing the Iridium Next program to a successful conclusion. Iridium's newest satellites now cover the entire planet, serving all Iridium's customers and enabling exciting new services for the world. This historic milestone also marks the start of Iridium's financial transformation as the company enters a long capital spending holiday. This is a day that's been over 30 years in the making, a day of celebration for Iridium, its customers, and the satellite industry. New services, new growth, and new revenue streams. A bright future lies ahead with a legacy of innovation to build upon. And on that note, I'd like to introduce Iridium CEO, Matt Desch. Well, thank you, Jordan. Good morning, everyone. This is a 
truly historic day, and I want to thank all of you here at the National Press Club. Uh, we have a full room here. Those of you on the webcast, welcome. I'm glad you could join us uh, for this day and for the news that we have uh, to provide you. Uh, I want to thank Denny and Tom for joining me. You'll hear from them in a few minutes. Uh, I'm also, you should know, looking out at uh, a number of media. I can tell by your notebooks. Uh, and uh, OK, Caleb has a PC. He's, he's new age. But, uh, um, but I also really want to thank uh, the people here from Iridium, particularly those of you from the, our Satellite Network Operations Center who uh, really have been working so hard for the last two years to bring our network online. And it's great to have them share this moment with us as well, but also all the members of our team here uh, from headquarters as well as um, a number here from Talis Alania. Thank you for joining us as well. So um, have have um, two announcements really for you today. Um, sort of the, you, saw, you got an idea what the first one is and we'll talk about the next one a little later on. Before I start though, I do want to acknowledge some recent news. Uh, last week, we made a very significant management change at Iridium, and I think it's noteworthy to bring it up today because Scott Smith, who I'm sure is watching along on the webcast here, um, really had a lot to do with getting us here today. He joined us just as we were finalizing the contract uh, with Talis Helenia, and all the activities, uh, $3 billion worth of them since that time, really were under his leadership. and. Uh, we're wishing him a very happy and well-earned retirement. Um, I'm sure he views this as one of the most defining accomplishments of his career. But we're also very excited to get Susie McBride back, who spent nine and a half years, actually spent a long time before that, but really is responsible for our launch strategy, that picking SpaceX, and our insurance strategy, a number of things that really also got us here successfully today. So it's, it's, uh, it's great to get Susie back uh, as well. I'm sure she's joining. So. Welcome, you start next week. Uh, we gotta get right on it. Um, so back to what we're here for today. So, you know, the idea for Iridium Next first came about in 2006. In fact, it was one of, really one of my prerequisites for joining Iridium was that this not be a end of life system, that we, that the board was prepared to take on the challenge of replacing the network uh, at some point. And I will say our first meeting on the subject was within a month or two of joining. Uh, I remember my whole satellite team got together. There were two people <laughs> at the time, um, li literally only two people. Um, and, the, and one of them had just come back into the company, uh, I think the previous month. Uh, this is Joe and Frank, for those of you who are remembering. And we sat in a room and they, I said, explain to me what it's, what it will take to build a satellite system or to replace the satellite system. Because while I had been involved in some very major capital programs in my past, uh, certainly involved in radio technology from the early days of cellular, I wasn't a space guy. And I didn't know what was involved. Uh, that first meeting was sobering, let's just say. <laughs> the, uh, the hill we had to climb, what we had to accomplish, and how to afford it were really still way in the future. And at the time, you know, um, I think I announced my intentions, our intentions, in 2007 to the industry. Um, appreciate the coverage, but I expect that a lot of it was skepticism behind the scenes of, given our history, given our past, and while we've been growing nicely, could we really accomplish such a daunting task? Um, so there were a lot of skeptics, I'm sure. Um, some I knew about publicly, and. Uh, quite a few privately, I'm sure, who were whispering behind the scenes, you know, could we get the financing we needed? Um, how could the original network stay in operation long enough for us to even accomplish it? It was only built the last seven or eight years. I mean, it was already year seven, I think, when I joined uh, seven or eight of the Constellation. Could it last long enough to possibly be there uh, and for us to stay in business? And, you know, given those first two challenges, why would we pick an unproven launch provider who had never even had a successful launch um, at that time? So there were a lot of risks ahead at the time, but there were also a lot of supporters as well. And I have to thank many, uh, certainly our customers, you know, the growing partner, partners, the ecosystem of partners we had around the world who were cheering us on, and many in the industry who were rooting for us as well, and I thank them all for their support and confidence. 
So what we're really here today, the first kind of big news, as you can tell, is that we're announcing that history has been made in this industry. Really the first time anything this big has been accomplished, and accomplished, frankly, so well. Um, we are officially today declaring victory. Our $3 billion Iridium Next campaign is complete. And, you know, while I know you saw the last launch with SpaceX, that was great, but there were a lot of things we had to do to get those satellites in place. And at exactly 2.15 p.m., it was exactly, I know, uh, <laughs> I was there. Um, the 65th and 66th satellites had their crosslinks simultaneously activated while the original Block 1 satellites were deactivated. Uh, and, and in the quickest of instance, literally our customers didn't even know what happened. Those that are even underneath those satellites didn't know. Um, but 100% of our traffic started flowing through um, the Iridium Next satellites. So let me repeat, the campaign that we started back in 2006, 2007 is complete. And that's a fantastic accomplishment. And you are allowed to applaud if you'd like right here. I'd say on to the future, but I'll, I'll wait for that. We have just a few more, uh, a little bit more perspective maybe to share on this. Um, so it also means for the first time since the initial launch of the system over 20 years ago, you know, zero, zero traffic is going through the old satellites. Uh, and you think about it, this is a retirement ceremony as, as well. Uh, all the Block 1 satellites, as we like to call our original satellites, for the lack of a better name, uh, lack of a cool name like Iridium Next satellites, um, you know, have really officially, as of 2.15 p.m. yesterday as well, been operationally retired. And I have to say, that was a bittersweet moment for us, uh, particularly for some of the people I'm seeing in the room who have been living with these kids, uh, living with these unique personalities and uh, systems for a long time. And frankly, they weren't supposed to last as long, but for the expertise and in, in, in this room. And so um, you saw me out there uh, using my, it wasn't my index finger, OK? <laughs> And frankly, I had no idea what I was doing, but thank you, uh, the team, for uh, letting, giving me the honor of really sending those commands to the satellites. Um, it really was the end of the era for, uh, for those satellites. And it was the end of the era, it's soon to be the end of the era for like the phenomenon of iridium flares, which so many people around the world I know appreciate and love. I certainly do. Uh, but you know, in the next few months, that will also be gone. So let me, let me remind you a little bit about that program. So we had 95 original satellites were launched on 22 launches, and they were all successful, by the way. The first launch was May 5th, 1997, and the network was first operational on November 1st, 1998. Um, that means our Block 1 satellites provide a customer service for 20 years and three months, which is, I mean, in Dog years, satellite years, I don't know what term, that's really, really, really a long time. And that's really, they deserve uh, just a moment really to appreciate that. Uh, I tried to do the math, We're, our math might not be right, but during that time, each satellite orbited the Earth approximately 100,000 times, uh, with the entire network completing approximately 7 million orbits of the planet. So they, they went a long way. Now, I'll leave it to you out there to do the math on 17,000 miles an hour and how many miles that is, but it's a long, long way, okay? Uh, they'd have gotten out of the solar system, certainly. So thank you, Block 1 satellites. You served us very well, and I hope, hope we've done you proud, too. So the second victor I just want to talk about a little bit here, maybe a little bit more detail, is about the projected life of our new network, you know, um, and the success of what was our risk mitigation strategy um, that we developed. So originally, I don't think it's completely well known, is that we designed Iridium Next back then for the, uh, replacing the 66 <coughs> operational satellites, and then we wanted one satellite per plane, per six planes, and we knew we had to somehow launch and activate 72 satellites. That would give us, with a design life, uh, a significant uh, return on the capital that we put into it. But instead of just building 72 satellites and, and taking out then traditionally as you would in the satellite industry an insurance policy for in case something happened on a launch or in case something happened to those satellites, uh, we really utilized a hybrid strategy. So 
What we did is we decided to build 81 satellites instead of just 75, uh, with the view that we'd have extra satellites enough if we had a launch failure. And we would just be hopeful that we didn't have a, a problem because, but if we did, we could take out an insurance policy for the second failure as opposed to the first failure. That's far less expensive than trying to replace the whole network from scratch. Um, it was much more economical, and, and the good thing is if you don't have a launch failure, you end up with extra satellites, which is a bonus, right? So I will tell you the launch strategy for Iridium changed a few times over, over the last 10 years. And I think we've been over that with most, but you know it, it encompassed a uh, uh, first launch with the Cosmotros Dnieper rocket that uh, didn't come to be. Uh, and, and it also meant adding a ride share, a very innovative approach with NASA for our sixth launch. Uh, but in the end, we actually ended up with 75 satellites in space instead of 72. So we have a little extra insurance policy there, if you will, on the network. But so, thanks to no launch failures, instead of six spares in orbit for the life of Iridium X, we actually ended up with nine in orbit spares and six more on the ground uh, as an eventual backup if we ever need them. Um, so that's good, but that's not, but wait, there's more. Uh, <laughs> I should add um, too, when you make 81 of anything like this, which hasn't happened many times in the industry, you expect to have some hardware issues in space. You. You uh, expect something that in the technology world we'd call infant mortality, right? Um, you know, in fact, in the, in the satellite industry for something like this, or really in the high tech industry, failures typically follow what you would call the bathtub curve because it looks like a bathtub turned upside down. Very early, first year, two, three, you have infant mortalities, which means you, you lose some satellites and then you don't lose any satellites for many, many years, and then at the end of life, as things wear out, you lose satellites. So it's sort of, that's what you expect to happen. Um, I will tell you right now, we've now had satellites on network for two years. So we're getting very comfortable that we're not experiencing that initial part of a bathtub curve. In fact, uh, we haven't really had any infant mortality issues with these satellites. They've been built very well, and that means uh, in fact, I would say I was looking at some insurance curves that were part of the presentations to the insurance companies who eventually did um, forecast, and they forecast that we would have two to four failures, and that would be fine, you know, because we still have plenty of satellites with a strategy that we had uh, to do it. But in fact, we don't think that's really likely to happen at all. So, um, so between having nine more satellites available spares than we first expected and not having the early failures uh, that were expected, we're now certainly very comfortable that uh, with our projection of 15 years or more for this network and possibly quite a bit more. You know, If you think about it, our current network lasted over 20 years with far less robust satellites and the same number of spares really um, when we started. So, you know, we're increasingly confident that it will be at least 10 years before we even have to start to think about replacing these satellites. So it's, uh, that doesn't mean we won't pursue other potential opportunities in the future, but it's a whole different thing when you can do it because it's a good business idea and it makes sense to do as opposed to something you have to do because you have to replace your network. So all that would not have been possible without the world-class team that I am blessed to work with at Iridium, and as well as the world-class partners like Talisalania Space and SpaceX. Um, I will say Talisalania built a great product for us, and of course SpaceX has been flawless in delivering that to space. Building X was not easy. Um, in fact, as I go back, six manufacturers initially expressed interest being our suppliers back in our first meetings back in 2008. So 11 years ago. Uh, but frankly, a number of them dropped out very early because they felt that the challenges were too difficult and the risks were too great, particularly for what we wanted to accomplish. You know, our network is one of the most technologically complex systems, you know, frankly, ever created on Earth or in space. Um, 66 satellites moving in low Earth orbit at 17,000 miles an hour, each one staying connected with uh, up to four others at any time, all interconnected in space, 
going seamlessly for a number of different services of, of varying types that grow over time. You know, a lot of processing in a spacecraft, that is not very easy to do. But the TALUS engineers, I have to say, deserve a lot of credit for their design and execution, as well as for assembling uh, really a world-class group of partners. Uh, it took a little longer than expected, and uh, given it was a fixed price co contract of almost $2.3 billion, it was probably a huge challenge for them as well. You know? But I want to really thank Jean-Luc Gall, his whole team, Denis, uh, who's here to talk about that a little bit, and also um, you know, for the fantastic work and the number of you who are here uh, for your work as well and spending time with us out here in Virginia as we've uh, installed and become friends of, friends of ours over the time. Uh, but I also want to make a special shout out too to the Northrop Grumman team, formerly Orbital ATK, particularly those out at Gilbert, Arizona, uh, sub-suppliers to Talis Elenia who assembled, integrated, and tested the, the devices. They kind of deserve sort of a special special credit for all the great work that they did too. And I also wanted to say a quick word about SpaceX where we obviously made a big bet very early. In fact, it was a half a billion dollar bet um, before they even had a successful launch. Well, you know, obviously we're huge fans of SpaceX and we're going to continue to cheer them on even though we don't need them anytime soon, uh, thankfully for their good work. But based upon the team they have and uh, I really believe they're certainly going to get to Mars and probably well beyond that. Uh, we have a lot, of, a lot of respect for them, and it goes without saying, but thank you to SpaceX. So uh, I would like to now introduce Denny Alar to say a few words um, from Talis Elenia. And uh, again, I thank Denny for his friendship and support and, uh, and for the job well done. So Denny, would you like to say a few words? Oh, by the way, I would like to start. I know that Denny has a video he'd like to uh, show first. So if we could maybe roll the video and do this better seamless transition the way that I did here. The dream really works. We achieved that dream. It came true. So good morning, and thank you, thank you for being with us today. And, th and uh, good morning, also good afternoon to all those that are connected uh, through the uh, uh, Iridium uh, website. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for inviting me on behalf of Jean-Louis. I'm uh, really pleased to be here today to celebrate that, uh, that day that we have been waiting for, for, for long. Today, we have achieved something uh, unique something that no one has ever done before. We have replaced the biggest satellite constellation in the world, I mean Iridium, block one, with a fresh constellation of new satellites, the next family, with absolutely no interruption of services. And not only that, but we have also improved the performances of the constellation. And there were no itches no itches. Everything has worked perfectly. And this is a world first. I think we, we, we can say that Iridium Next is the most sophisticated and complex software-driven program ever put into orbit. And this is unique in various ways. First, with the Iridium Next satellite, it's still the world's biggest in-orbit constellation. 
Its unique architecture, independent from any ground network, allows connecting people everywhere on Earth while offering vital services in case of emergencies. Second, for the first time in history, we have replaced one constellation by another one without interrupting the services. And this is key for, for the customers, as you said, Matt. Each satellite was replaced one by one, turning off the old one and turning on the new one simultaneously. Third, Iridium Next satellites, while ensuring service continuity, is providing enhanced performances and brand new services to all users. But replacing a constellation without interrupting services is quite complex. And as I said, has never done, been done before. And we feel very proud of that. And I guess that a lot of companies are looking at us and, and are learning. It's only two days, two years, sorry, after we launched our first batch of satellites, and here we are. With the last, the last two L-band antenna turned on yesterday, and the last two block one satellites turned off at the very same time. Today, the Iridium Next constellation is fully operational. It's a big, big achievement for everyone that has been involved. This project has been a, a big international collaboration. We have done this with our partners in Europe and in the States. So first, Iridium, our customer. But to be honest, we have been working with, the, with the, you, Matt, and your team much more as a partner than as a customer. Then Nostrop Grumman, ex-Orbital ATK, which were in charge of all the satellite AIT and launch preparation activities. And SpaceX, for sure, which successfully orbited our 75 satellites in eight successful uh, launches. And finally, all the other subcontractors, and there are many of them. They have all contributed to vital elements of the project, and we are grateful for their expertise. But the key of the success of, the Irid of Iridium Next has been our one team spirit. And we have all come together to make this work. It has been a real partnership, and we have made close friends along the way. And I'm sure that we will meet uh, each other quite soon. So today, the 75 satellites are in orbit, and they are working perfectly. The overall end-to-end -end performances of the system is amazing. But it has not been easy, as you said, Matt. Not easy. But failure was never an option. Never. So for sure, we did face some difficult time, if I remember some years ago. But we never gave up. Everyone pulled together. We were one team. And despite the challenges, no one left the program. No one. And if we succeeded at the end, to me, this is one of the main reasons. So it has been a huge, a huge success from success story from the beginning till the end, from the design phase to the in-orbit operations. And today I have a special thought to all those people who worked during the design phase of the program some years ago, because if we celebrate today, if we succeed today, it's because, it's because they did it right at the beginning. But as you know, a good design might be important, but it's not enough to make a success. And even more with the constellations, because there are so many elements. You need dedicated supply chains with many partners, assembly integration and test centers, validation test labs, operation centers, and we had to innovate at so many levels. So it's wonderful that everyone who worked on Iridium Next became totally, totally involved in the program. And for all of us, Iridium Next is a one-of-a-kind program. And a lot of our engineers wanted to work on it because of the feeling of collective success. 
And it's very a good feeling to know that you are working on something uh, that will mark history in space. And I re remember one of Thales' engineers saying Iridium is the program that all telecom engineers dream of working on one day. So it's a great day today. And I'm proud to say that through the Iridium Next program, Thales Senior Space has once again demonstrated its ability to master very large scale communication systems from design to in orbit delivery. So Matt, on behalf of Jean-Louis, I would like to thank you again for having placed your trust in Thales and a big, a big thank you, everybody who contributed to this unique success. Well, thank you, Denis. Um, by the way, I know we're going to keep moving on here, but I do want to call out one person who snuck in here, Steve Pfeiffer. I know he's... Uh, uh, he's a member of our board of directors, and that's not the reason, just because he's my boss, that I'm calling him out. But, uh, <laughs> but, but Steve has been associated with uh, Iridium longer than anybody, really. You go back uh, to really, really the early days, and I just want to—I'm glad you're here to to join us and represent the rest of the board of directors on behalf of that. So thanks, thanks, Steve, for for being here. Um, now, I've, I've shared these stats before, but if you count our original network, our total number of satellites now that Iridium launched either beginning at the beginning or today is now 170 with 30 total launches and zero launch failures. So I think that's probably a record for communication. Uh, I think it meant we, um, we've covered a lot of our things, but I, I do want to note just for you, if you don't, haven't seen our satellites, they are not small. You know, these, we are what I still believe to be the first successful new space company because we got smaller satellites than typical in, in LEO providing advanced unique services. Um, maybe we're an old new space company, I don't know what you want to call it, but you know, each of our satellites weighs about a ton, you know, and they're about the size of a Mini Cooper automobile, of which, as you know, we launched in 10 on a rocket, that was a pretty big payload overall. Um, so, um, um, you know, shifting gears a little bit, many, many who followed our journeys or maybe read one of the books written about Iridium, like Eccentric Orbits, I, I recommend it. I'm not sure what its what its point is, <laughs> other than it's very difficult to launch and have a network like this. Um, I call it the rise, dramatic fall, and initial rise again of, of of a company. But it's a it's a pretty rare story in a very capital intensive industry like like space, um, and and one that works by the way in a very extreme operating environment. Um, that you kind of have a story like this. Um, I think there's a lot of inspiration to be found in what we've done, uh, especially for many of the upstarts um, and new, new companies who are still putting their pieces of their plans together and we wish them well, but we're a cautionary tale as well, you know, because it's very, very challenging to get to that point. I like to say we're a 30-year overnight success story, you know, uh, because in many ways people now suddenly forget sort of what, what we went through to get to today, but it's certainly the time to be there. A uh, quick few facts about Block One, and then I want to talk about the financial impact of this. Um, last re-entry was SV90 about uh, 10 days ago or so, I, can't, uh, I think, as it burned up over the Pacific Ocean. That was the 47th re-entry of a Block One satellites uh, of the 66 we had in the original network. So I think we're doing a very good job of cleaning up after ourselves in space. Um, we honor them, but unfortunately it's their time and we need to really retire them and make sure they don't get in the way of anything else. Um, so just a scorecard for those of you. Uh, we have now initiated the de-boost de of 52 Block 1 satellites. 47 of them have re-entered so far. The median time from the time they passivate, which is when we take all the energy out of them about a week or so after we start the process of de-boosting, uh, to the time in which they catch in the atmosphere and actually burn up has been 19 days, which, if you will, that's a really great performance, by the way, to the team. We wanted to keep it under a year, and we're keeping it well. We're keeping it within a month right now, which I think is really fantastic performance. So um, we still have 13 more 
to go and frankly we're going to be doing that over the next couple months so we'll be pretty much done with the whole network here uh, this year uh, in terms of that so um, to put in this you know we've talked about what we've technically accomplished today but I'd like Tom to spend a few minutes to try to put this in perspective from a business and financial perspective uh, it doesn't just mean that we've completed our three billion dollar next program but it also means that our financial transformation, which we've long talked about, has begun, and I want him to explain that. So, Tom, could you uh, come up and take a few minutes? Thanks. Good morning, everybody. I'd, um, I'd like to join Matt in welcoming you to this uh, momentous occasion, the completion of Iridium Next. And I have to say, you know, reflecting on that, it's just, I can't believe we're done. Uh, <laughs> but it feels great. Um, so as CFO, I thought I'd take you through some details on the financing of, of this um, project, uh, including our financial circumstance in 2010 when it was initiated, as well as some of the twists and turns, if you will, along the way. Um, it, it seems as though that there would be some analogs to what we went through to businesses in the new space venture that are contemplating you know, their own financings of, of uh, the networks that they uh, are thinking about. So a couple of weeks ago, CBS News describes Iridium's replacement of its aging constellation with the new $3 billion state-of-the-art network as, quote, the largest technology refresh the universe has ever seen. The financing of this undertaking was no less daunting. And that is because at the time that the financing was arranged, Iridium's cash flow sort of on a trailing basis was $135 million. And most bankers at the time said that uh, financing of a $3 billion network by a company with $135 million in cash flow was impossible. The credit markets would not support such an undertaking. The credit statistics just did not support it. Well, today, we know that, in fact, it was financed, and, we're and the project is complete. The centerpiece of the financing for the uh, Iridium Next Constellation was a $1.8 billion credit facility guaranteed by the French Treasury and syndicated among nine European banks with Societe Generale as the lead agent. <coughs> the French state provided uh, certain guarantees through their export credit bank in support of Talisalania, uh, a Franco-Italian uh, manufacturer on the business, and you heard from, from Danny here this morning. So make no mistake about it. The mere availability of this financing was remarkable. Its structure and operation were equally so. This facility was structured so, such that Iridium could draw on it over the seven year uh, construction period, whereas conventional credits would call, call for a drawing upfront uh, at closing. This is an incredibly important piece of the uh, puzzle because Iridium could not have absorbed the interest expense had they drawn the whole facility at closing. Similarly, the loan bears interest at about a 5% rate. Uh, so conventional financing, had it been available, would have been double that. Finally, this facility was scheduled to be repaid over the seven years following the Constellation construction for a total tenor of 14 years, cons considerably longer than would be available in uh, regular way credit markets. Iridium, the lenders, and the French government took extraordinary risks to get this project completed. SpaceX. Iridium's launch provider was unproven in 2010 when the loan was closed. As I'm sure many of you have heard Matt share in the past, Iridium's next best alternative was double the price. Similarly, the financing plan underpinning the loan assumed the receipt of some $260 million in proceeds from Iridium hosting other payloads on the satellites. There were no contracts for these services even close to being signed when the loan was closed. Today, Iridium has contracts with Arion and Harris for $300 million <clears throat> for the hosting of their payloads on Iridium Next. So these lenders placed a risky bet on Iridium, and today we know it quite well, it was quite well placed. An important part of the Iridium story is Arion. At the time the credit facility was closed, Arion was nothing more than an idea for a hosted payload, without backers and without capital. Nonetheless, the idea was so compelling that Iridium selected Arion as its primary hosted payload for Iridium Next, 
and estimated that the yet to be in existence Arion would pay Iridium a $200 million hosting fee. Iridium's first challenge was convincing its lenders to allow it to invest $12.5 million into the venture to get it started. So you can imagine the lenders were a bit confused at that ask, right? The hosted payload was supposed to be revenue coming into Iridium to get uh, to the Iridium Next constellation done. And the notion that we'd, the first step would be $12.5 million to go out, uh, let's just say it didn't go over that well at first. They war let's just say they warmed the idea over time. And uh, Arium went on to raise an additional $340 million in equity capital from leading air navigation service providers around the world. Today, Arion's payload is operational on all 66 of Iridium Next satellites in orbit, seeing planes over the oceans that have never been seen before, and we look forward to their future announcement regarding the system being commercially live. Arion has paid Iridium over $40 million in hosting fees and is well positioned to pay the remaining $160 million in the coming years. Iridium's $12.5 million investment in Arion is today worth around $270 million based on Arion's latest funding round. As is typical with a construction project as complex as Iridium Next, everything did not go as planned at the outset in 2010. Manufacturing and launch delays caused the project to slip, and this impacted certain deliverables under the credit facility. The facility had to be materially renegotiated four times during the construction period. Each time, Iridium agreed to raise additional capital in support of the project in exchange for necessary concession from the lenders. In all, nearly 700 million was raised in common stock, convertible preferred stock, and high yield debt offerings between 2012 and 2018. With the successful final Iridium Next launch completed on January 11th, and all satellites now operational in our con constellation, the associated capital spending comes to an end. <clears throat> this ushers in a financial transformation that is quite stark. I, I've known you have heard us speak before about this, but please let me explain just how unique and compelling a case Iridium has now become. Capital expenditures that averaged $435 million in the last three years will drop to approximately $35 million and average that for a decade. When coupled with continued growth in our business and other factors, this yields an exceptional excess cash flow profile. Iridium is now an incredibly unusual company with growing revenues and significant free cash flow. Some companies have one or the other. It's very unusual to have both. After a planned refinancing as early as the second half of this year, Iridium will eventually use its ex excess cash flow to pay dividends, buy back shares, and explore other profit-driven opportunities. These equity-friendly actions are supportive of the trading of the stock. Wall Street began to recognize the imminent financial transformation in May of last year as the end of the construction period approached. In fact, Iridium shares were up more than 56% in 2018 and up 92% over the past two years. Besting the performance of high-flying stock market darlings like Amazon, up 28% in 2018, and Netflix, up 39%, while approaching their two-year returns as well. The successful completion of Iridium Next has profound implications for Iridium's longevity. The financing of the successor network to, Irid to Iridium Next in around 2030 will be a layup compared to what was just accomplished. Iridium's operating profits should double to about $600 million in that time frame, which easily finances a capital program that should be less than the $3 billion that was spent on Iridium Next. Additionally, we already have Arion lined up as a high-value hosted payload customer for the next constellation. It's a generational capability that exclusively serves a critical need for the world. This will further facilitate the financing of the future constellation. The success of Iridium Next will ensure the continuation of the one-of-a-kind, mission-critical functionality of the Iridium network. And as a result, Iridium shareholders will be rewarded for this success for many years to come. Thank you. So thanks, Tom. Um, Tom's been a critical to our success as well as we work through um, you know, 
really not just the technical part of this, but the financial part of it as well. So um, it, it's great to declare victory on many different fronts here financially as well as technical. Uh, but wait, there's more. <laughs> uh, just a few more minutes, and then I really want get to get to questions and answers. But we really want to have another sort of announcement here, uh, because I want to talk about what this network is here for, the things that it does. Uh, of course, it's saving lives around the world. It's performing important activities that, as Tom's mentioned, has caused us to grow. Um, but I want to talk about some of the new things it can do that hasn't been done before. And it's important, first of all, to give just a quick background on Iridium Certus. I think you, most of you know Iridium Certus is our name for the technology we built on Iridium Next. Uh, it's a broadband technology, but I think some of people are confusing as like a single service. Um, it's actually a very versatile and powerful platform, and I want to unveil another piece of that platform today to help you understand really the potential and power of it it has on our network going long term. So sorry for a, a little bit of radio technology stuff here, but the primary function of a communication satellite is to make a connection between a user on the ground and a satellite going overhead, and then relaying that back, most satellites right directly to the ground, or in our case, over a number of different satellites, back to the user on the ground who's in the internet or talking on a mobile phone or whatever they might be doing. Um, now, the first network we had did that extremely well. Uh, but it was really designed in the early 1990s, and the technology, particularly the user devices, was really optimized around making voice connections. Um, while it was capable of transmitting data, the connections were at a very low, low speed. In fact, the data channel was optimized to operate at 2.4 kilobytes per second. That's really slow, okay? However, it's really powerful, too, if you can do it anywhere on the planet. And, of course, we've taken advantage of that uh, for a number of different additional applications like IoT, the Internet of Things, where we're growing quite well. Now, not to get too technical, but when you're making a connection between a satellite far away and a terminal on the ground, you have to make a lot of engineering trade-offs between how you do that. Physics is physics. It does, there's been no uh, complete revolutions uh, in the last 20 years that completely changed the physics. It's usually, if you want more speed, you normally uh, you need not only more spectrum, but you also need a bigger antenna aperture. You probably need more power, too, to push more bandwidth through uh, to get the number of digital symbols across. Uh, and if you need more power, then you're probably sacrificing mobility because you're certainly not going to be able to battery power it. Uh, you're going to have to pa uh, power it in other ways. Mobile applications are a lot more complicated than fixed ones. So I, I think you get it. There's a lot of trade-offs in the engineering of the system. Uh, the new new space guys are going through this trade-offs right now. They're trying to optimize their system traditionally really around large bandwidth, and that means bigger antennas. And by the way, valuable applications, very important, not what we do. Those are in sort of commodity broadband areas typically, and they're exciting and they're big. Uh, there's a lot of competition in that space, but they need more, bigger antennas, more power, traditionally somewhat less mobility, et cetera. Um, one of the reasons we've been so successful is that the original engineers optimized our system around some very key attributes that have proven to be very, very valuable to us. Um, and they focused on extreme mobility, the ability to really move at very fast speeds, yet at low power because of the connections between space and us, and the smallest and lowest cost antennas possible. That's why we really have great satellite phones. That's why we have great IoT services. Now, when we created the requirements for Iridium Next and what we wanted to do across, we wanted a system that would still be able to support all those very small, very mobile, low-speed services that were successful in IoT, but we also wanted to move into new markets and new applications. So several years ago, we started developing that in a new technology called Iridium Certus. Um, it's actually a completely independent platform on top of these satellites. It required lots of new software, or new ground systems on the ground, and new user terminals, completely optimized around the new potential and power of these satellites. It uses our L-band, which is very valuable spectrum, much more efficiently, um, and also the fact that our satellites are close to us so that we could make satellites, uh, antennas smaller, cheaper, and yet still get a lot of data through them. Um, we wanted to really be better than anything out there today, 
and build a platform that could scale up and down as we could in the future. So a few weeks ago, I think you saw the initial products from that extensive development were finally ready for the world, and we launched initial service for the maritime and terrestrial industries. Aviation products are underway and will be available later this year. Uh, some of them are here, and uh, those of you can see, those are real products over there on real ships. Now, we could have engineered Iridium Certus to provide really, really fast speeds, but that would have been really big antennas, and frankly, the VSAT players do that very, very well. We're typically used in a companion kind of application to VSAT, and they should be the ones to really do that. That's their service. That's not ours. Instead, we optimized our system for extreme mobility and low cost to get all those industrial applications, specialty important safety applications uh, to market in the smallest, lightest, lowest cost terminal that they can get. So last year, uh, as part of that, you know, we introduced what's called the BCX, the Broadband Core Transceiver. And this is the core of what makes a connection to our satellites on Iridium Certus. It's what's in all those terminals today. It, it's really been optimized through small antennas, and you can see a comparison with uh, a competitor's uh, antenna, how much smaller they're able to be to get speeds today of 350 kilobits per second, later on this year with a software upgrade, 700 kilobits per second. That's the fastest you can do in L-band. Very powerful, very capable, um, and, and really optimized um, for that. So it's available today. It's working well. Just a status update. We have more than 30 distribution partners selling it on ships and for terrestrial applications and soon on airplanes. The activations are proceeding. It's kind of early days, but I have to tell you I'm really pleased with the early take up and the excitement around the service. Um, there's a lot of excitement amongst our partner base because they finally have a product to compete with Inmarsat, uh, who's been the sole one in the market in this place, who often competes with them. Uh, but that's for the higher speed services. Um, but as I said, Certus is really a platform, and it's the name we use to make the ideal connections between our satellites and users. Um, the real sweet spot for Iridium is, I think, actually being able to scale this technology down to provide more data in much smaller packages, and that's what we're spending our R&D on today. And that's what I wanted to talk about briefly. Um, you know, we're really successful at IoT. Just in the last reported quarter, I think we grew at something like 26%, you know, well over 600,000 devices on our network. That's, if you will, what we're getting known for. Um, devices on airplanes, ships that are low cost and very highly mobile. What I really wanted, and what we really wanted, was something you could get a lot of data more through a, a terminal this size, really small. In fact, this is, this is large compared to what it will ultimately be. And by the way, this is a real antenna from our, I thank our partners up here um, just north of us, Max Tenna, who gave me this. This is a device for this product. But what we're really announcing today is this. This is the new Iridium 9770 transceiver. Uh, you can see what it looks like, how small it is. Um, this is what we've been alluded to. This is a Certus device. Uh, that basically takes that and scales it down for cost and size to be able to operate with low-cost, small, passive antennas. Antennas that cost $20 or $30 rather than thousands of dollars, and yet still be able to get a lot of data through it. In fact, the initial pr product, uh, which is, um, which provides data about 35 times faster than our old LBT, uh, this provides an IP, IP data connection. This provides multiple voice lines, very high quality voice lines, higher quality than, than services we have today. Um, and, and, uh, and the data channel is, de is designed to get through a small passive low cost antenna up to 88 kilobits per second. Um, so that's a lot of data through a very small, very portable device that can frankly be put into portable, uh, into even consumer applications and into lots more vehicles, systems of all types. Um, there's gonna be future variants of this that scale this even down further. In fact, it will be a fraction of this size that will go say more 22 kilobits per second, 44, be uh, probably a variant or different variants of that that will be lower power, be able to be even more battery powered and will provide and will be ideal for applications in the IoT space, particularly. Um, 
So we're spending a lot of R&D this year on finishing the product. This will be in the hands of select manufacturing partners mid-year. Uh, we're already talking to people about licensing the technology in here and utilizing this, and it's going to be generally available towards the end of this year. Uh, and I think we'll start driving uh, new application services we haven't even dreamed possible uh, starting next year and the years beyond. So exciting development, and I just wanted to bring that forward because it's not just that we've completed this network, but that we actually have exciting and valuable new architectures. Um, just give you ideas what some of the things that you could use this thing for, just a couple ideas. In Maritime, it could support lower cost GM DSS terminals. You know, that's a, te a technology we're now certified for and will be available at the end of this year, um, make it, making them affordable for even smaller maritime craft. In aviation, this is great for advanced ACARS messaging, black box streaming, including voice now, instead of just da data applications, multiple voice channels could, could fit through here, advanced flight bag applications of all type, lots of rich telemetry, uh, much richer t telemetry from remote machines and vehicles of all types. Uh, it supports pictures and low resolution video at those kind of speeds. So you can start seeing remote monitoring cameras and security applications that we can't handle today. Um, internet access, including fully featured email, fully featured <coughs> and native chat applications now, instead of cut down versions of texting, it, it will support pictures and other things. Uh, it'll have the necessary speed for more secure encryption in applications if, if customers want to uh, embody that. Uh, for command and control for unmanned vehicles, for aircraft, for submersibles, for so many types of things that we can't even imagine. So a uh, really infinite number of applications we think something like this and the variants that will spin off of this in the next uh, few years. But it's all empowered by this powerful new Iridium Next platform that we have completed yesterday and the new technologies we've delivered in Iridium Certus. And I'm really, really excited what that means for the continued potential growth of the company uh, than where we've gone today. So uh, with that, I think it's time for a few questions. And you know, this is a historic occasion. I hope uh, you've appreciated what we've done. We have some microphones, I think, in the audience. And if you, any of you have uh, any follow-ups to any of us, we'd be glad to answer those questions, or perhaps even on the, on the webcast. Yeah. Jordan? Okay. All right. You want to come up here for that? Or? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think Bill has a question. Kick it off. Thank you. All right. Uh, hello, uh, Bill Carey with Aviation Week for Mr. Desh. Um, can can you talk about any airlines that may be participating in operational trials of Certus uh, beginning this year? Yeah. So. Um, uh, aviation is coming. You've seen some of the announcements from a couple of our partners who have already kind of gotten uh, access to put uh, Iridium technology on line fit aircraft. Uh, you saw one recently. I'll, I'll leave it to you to you know you know which ones I'm talking about because I don't want to single out one one or the other. Um, but uh, the Certus devices will be available later on this year and really go into more certification more in the second half of this year. So there haven't been any live demonstrations on aircraft, more just uh, technical demonstrations of maritime and land products as the aviation products go through the development and certifications. But uh, there are, uh, I can say that a lot of airlines are increasingly looking to Iridium to provide their operational communications. Again, we're the only network that covers 100% of the planet. Aircraft tend to fly across every part of the planet. Um, we're low cost, we're highly reliable, we have a brand new network, you can see why we're in more and more cockpits. Thanks, Bill. Hi, Caleb Henry, Space News, the guy with a Mac instead of the notebook. Um, <laughs> question for one, one for each. Um, Matt, you mentioned that there were 52 satellites um, that had been uh, deboosted, and then you have 13 to go. That adds up to 65, and I thought the original system was 66. So can you tell me what happened to that one that's missing? Um, for Dennis, I'm curious how you see this, your work done with uh, Iridium playing into your competition for the Telesat LEO constellation. Uh, do you see any crossovers and benefits? And then for um, Tom, you mentioned that there's going to be 35 million, roughly, of annual uh, capex, which is much lower than when Iridium Next was being deployed. Can you just shed some light on what that 35 million will be used for where you anticipate investing that? 
Okay, so uh, first question, you count very well, Caleb, thank you. Uh, I thought you were good at English, not math, but uh, you're, good at, you're good at both, obviously. Uh, in fact, when we started the process of deorbiting, we did not have a full constellation. So when we launched last year in January, we had, um, after the 12 years or whatever I'd been here, uh, we actually had, uh, we ran out of spares. So our customers didn't know it because, again, we have a very resilient network architecture that only meant maybe a, a few minutes outage once or twice a day to any individual person uh, on the planet, but we were really operating a satellite short. So you're right, we don't have 66 satellites in Europe, we only had 65. I will say we, we, I talked about the bathtub failure, you know, curve. We had a bathtub <laughs> curve with the first generation. We lost probably, um, I don't know, 15 satellites or so very early on in the initial program, and eventually over time we lost about 15 more, about 33 satellites in space didn't make it to deorbiting. So the math actually could add up to a bigger number if we wouldn't have had those failures. Um, it's one of the reasons why we really, really wanted a high quality satellite this time around. We didn't want those kind of issues. And I'm really fortunate that we're not gonna have those kind of early issues that will leave satellites in space. We want them all out of space. So you are asking a question about uh, Telesat, and uh, so you know that uh, the Thales in space, the experience that we have in Constellation, so Iridium being the latest, put us in a very good uh, position as far as uh, other competition. So yeah, we are working on the Telesat, you know it, it's public, and uh, the experience that we gained on the, on the Iridium and what we have demonstrated uh, he, he put, put us in a very good position on this uh, on this program, but also on the other opportunity that we may uh, on which we are working on. So the, th the thirty-five million that we quote as an average for the, for the next decade is, is so-called maintenance capex. It's for things like uh, software upgrades, new product development, um, IT at the at our facilities, that sort of thing. What the headline is, is what has stopped is expenditures relative to the $3 billion construction of our, of our new network. That's over, and we go into a period here where we're just, where we're just uh, spending maintenance capex. And, you know, the, the period prior to commencing Iridium Next, sort of prior to 2010, if you looked at Iridium's capital expenditures during that period, it was sub $20 million, okay? And so that's, we're saying, we're going back into uh, that, that period where we're not in the construction mode of a new network, and we, our estimate is that average is $35 million for about a decade. All right. Do we have uh, any other questions? Nope. All right. Seeing that we are actually a little bit past 11 a.m., uh, we're going to conclude at this point. I'd like to thank everyone for coming and for everyone tuning in at the webcast. Uh, anyone who sent in some questions, we will respond to you. Don't worry about that. Uh, and uh, thank you, everyone, for coming, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.